Thank you so much, Sam. Good morning, everyone. It's really a thrill to be here today to talk with you about this important topic of poverty and where we are on the war on poverty, for example. But first, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, myself and my thoughts on parenting. As Vivian and Ioma alluded to, we really took a view on the parenting committee of parenting and being parented as a lifespan approach. Um, I am the daughter of Irma and Richard. My mom um, emigrated to the United States from Germany. Uh, she grew up in Germany. She was born in 1940. She went in and out of an orphanage there uh, with her siblings um, during the, uh, towards the end of the wartime. Um, and she came here to the United States to Philadelphia to live with an uncle at age 14. She was not put into a loving home in Germany. She was in a home that was very cold and not very caring. And when she had me at age 25, she had to be told to pick me up, to hold me, to cuddle me. She did not know that intuitively. And this might be the case with some of the parents that you work with. This may be the case. She did not have a role model for that. So again, when we think about the intergenerational effects of parenting, when we think about what it takes to be a quote unquote good parent, these are not necessarily things that are inside of individuals. These are things perhaps that are learned. That's our whole idea about early childhood intervention. And that's just a bit of my story. I currently co-parent a teenage daughter, and I couldn't have come to the, uh, to the parenting committee meetings without the support of a lot of people in my life. So again, just a little bit about my journey as a parent and thinking about parenting as an intergenerational experience um, that we're all working towards. I also wanted to note that I am a social media person and I'm on Twitter and I've been live tweeting today. So um, I am at Kim Bowler one So go ahead and uh, feel comfortable. If I'm on my phone, that's why I'm on my phone. Um, so what I wanted to talk a bit about today and was asked to talk about the question of poverty in, in families, um, and as we talked a bit about it in the report, I want to look at this question of what was the war on poverty? What are the definitions of poverty in this country and around the world? I'm going to look back a bit. I want to talk about our safety net, the status of our safety net. I want to talk about the things in addition to tax policy, income policy, the, the supports that we looked at in the report, and Ioma and uh, Vivian talked a bit about that as well, parenting programs, two-generation programs, the new look at two-generation programs that are going on right now. I want to talk about the idea of innovation and improvement that is in those reports. I want to talk about the idea of tailoring solutions to specific families, exactly what was brought up in the question period earlier. How do you know which families need which kinds of services at a given depth of poverty? These are really important questions that I'm sure many of you have faced in your work as well. And I want to talk about this idea of involving families in solution making. So let's think about the definition of poverty in this country and poverty thresholds. The definitions of poverty were actually put together by Molly Oshansky in the Social Security Administration back in 1963 and 64. She's known as Ms. Poverty, Mrs. Poverty, she's deceased now. Um, and these idea of the, of the, it's actually a complex computation of poverty that went into this. And they informed the poverty guidelines that many of you use. And the definition of poverty in 2017 is for a family of four, uh, a cash income of $24,600. So again, that dollar amount, I don't think many people know that when we talk about poverty. Uh, many of you do, of course, in the programs that you work in. Think about how far that goes here um, in Omaha. Think about what that does in San Francisco, what it might do in Kansas City as opposed to Miami, Florida. Deep poverty is defined as half of that, 50% of poverty, $12,300. And let's think about 0 to 20% of poverty, what that looks like, and so on. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about the cutoffs for other programs. Um, and when I called Greg Duncan, who was also on our committee, um, he's an economist, and I talked to him a bit about these ideas of the various thresholds and what that might mean for families, because again, we know that being in poverty itself is a, is a very high risk for very poor outcomes for children, both for school outcomes, for later life outcomes. 
um, he said, Kim, I really want you to think about the idea of supplemental measures of poverty. The, uh, these are, again, complex measures, comp uh, complex computations that take into account uh, families' access to um, the government programs that are available to them, that the income supports that we know of, and subtracts out various taxes and so on. Um, and we'll talk about those in a minute as well. Um, that's another measure. And the question is, how are we doing on those, the income supports? And when you look at those together, you find that we actually have lifted many people out of poverty in this country over the years. Um, so that's important to be keeping in mind as well. So when we think about, um, hang on, we're having our issue with the clicker. Um, when we see, oops, now I went too far. Okay, there we go. When we think about looking back a bit, this was a landmark report. This is a Future of Children volume. This is a great series if you haven't taken a look at it yourself. It's still ongoing today. But this, this volume was particularly on child poverty. This is in 1997. And the quote here says, about one in five American children have lived in families in which cash income failed to exceed official poverty thresholds. Um, so again, about 20% uh, of families living in, uh, children living in poverty back in 1997. And how are we doing today? Today, about 19% of children birth to 18, uh, that's the poverty rate today. 12% of adults, 18 to 64, and 9% of older adults, 64, 65 and up. And so you say to yourself, and I think many of you have heard this before, older Americans are less likely to be in poverty. And why is that? Well, we have Social Security, we have uh, the Medicare supports for, for older adults, and actually an anecdotal, or not anecdotal, a piece of data that you might be interested in is when you ask uh, Americans, uh, adults who's happy in this country, older Americans are among the happiest. And you might say, well, why is that? Well, they're less likely to be in poverty is one of the correlations potentially there as well. So as we look over time, 1997 to now, and the trends over time, um, we see pretty stagnant uh, poverty rates for children in this country. When we look at things like our safety net, uh, for example, our aging safety net, and again, the war on poverty was declared by President Johnson in his State of the Union address in 1964, and really got going um, in 1965, we would say. Uh, so we'd say the war on poverty turned 50 in 2014. A lot was written about that in 2014. Did we win it? Did we not win it? It's still going on, I would say. Um, Head Start itself turned uh, 52 this year. That's a program that you have to be eligible for at 100% of poverty. WIC is 45 this year, the special supplemental program for women, infants, and children. Uh, and the earned income tax credit, which Ioma alluded to, is 42 this year. So let's think about these indicators of progress. So um, when we think about the supplemental measures, as I talked about before, these additions of things like WIC, things like the earned income tax credit, you would say then we've risen, we have, uh, people have, uh, taking people out of poverty, per se, if you only take cash into account, from 19% to, say, 11%. And people sort of say that's a success, right, if we include our safety net programs into the cash programs. But again, um, when we think about those being threatened, those being taken away, we have a real concern here when we think about poverty, when we think about poverty programs. So that's something to be keeping in mind. So the safety net uh, and these supplemental measures do show that we are able to, quote unquote, move families, move children out of poverty. But if those are taken away, that will not be the case. So the question is, um, as we think about the areas of need, when we think about the issues of families in poverty, there needs to be, again, sort of a thinking of the political will for addressing poverty as the potential elephant in the room, right? So if poverty is an underlying root cause of the issues related to poor child outcomes, there has to be a question of addressing poverty head on, continuing to think about poverty and deep poverty in particular as one of the major risk factors for, for poor child outcomes. Greg, when I called him, I didn't realize this, there is a new National Academy of Sciences study that he is chairing on the question of, and the title is actually a great title, the Committee on Building an Agenda to Reduce the Number of Children in Poverty by Half in 10 Years. 
So this is bringing together the best minds in our country to look at all of the programs and policies we have in place, tax policy, the supplemental supports for income, parenting programs, and so on, and thinking about what can we do to make the child policy, uh, the child uh, poverty rate, half in 10 years from now. They're having their first meeting on June 21st. I urge all of you to, you can potentially tune in by webinar, you can send letters, you can, again, weigh in on this committee's work and follow that work very closely um, to, again, support what they're doing and think about what that might take. Again, I think this question of what does it mean to look at the poverty population, the families in need, by certain levels of poverty, the 0 to 20 percent families? Do you know that in your own caseloads, in your own programs? I, I personally think in the national data, we don't look at this really. We don't know. We don't think about effects of programs on families by different levels of income. Have you, do you know about that? For example, when we think about early Head Start and Head Start, those are programs potentially for the families who can actually get their children to school every day, get their children to programs every day. Um, there are families who cannot do that. Where are those children? How are those children's needs being met? Are they being met? So again, thinking about poverty, again, in this way, segmenting poverty and by deep poverty, deeper poverty, and thinking about how children's needs are and are not being met. So as we heard about in the previous presentation, what the committee did was think about other ways that children are being served. We reviewed the evidence for these types of programs um, for focused on parents and poverty reduction overall. We also aimed uh, to look at what were the poverty reduction strategies in parenting programs, parenting education, uh, looking at the knowledge, attitudes, and practices. So things like home visiting, for example. Um, again, working through parents, getting them the referrals and services and supports for work and education. Um, programs, these two generation programs, Head Start, Early Head Start is a two generation program that has a major parenting component to it. Um, Educare, um, which you have here in your community, and I had the great pleasure to go see yesterday. Abby Rakes, Jesse Rasmussen took me out to see the Indian Hill program, which was fabulous. Um, when we were looking at that in the report, um, it was still having a randomized control trial underway. That's recently been published in Child Development. I'll talk about that in a moment. At the same time, a group of international researchers were putting together the third uh, volume of The Lancet, the journal The Lancet, a special section looking internationally at the evidence for programs around the world. And that was also very exciting, and I've been thinking about that a lot as well, and we'll talk about that too. So the evidence for making a difference um, related to poverty has, again, this two-generation idea. If you can affect parenting and get children on a new trajectory, a higher level trajectory, more school readiness, less special education, um, again, their own education improved, parents helping their children, um, schools being ready, and so on, um, you could also reduce poverty in this way. That, again, is the whole idea of Head Start and so on, and that part of the war on poverty. Um, and again, as Vivian and Dioma mentioned, we came to Nebraska as part of the committee activities and interviewed parents here and asked them about their thoughts about these types of programs. And this is the, the words of a mother here in Nebraska. And she said, I always prefer education for the parents from the beginning to the end. From pregnancy, some don't know when to go to the doctor. So, so we need education from the beginning to the end. Again, an endorsement for the idea that parenting supports really do matter in helping in parenting education for children. Reinforces the words from the, from the survey we heard about as well. Oops, not yet, hang on. I wanted to talk about um, this idea of home visiting as a way to support parents, as a way to support them in their parenting role and provide that parenting education. This goes back to something that was happening um, with candidate Obama as he was running for president, a commitment that he had to nurse family partnership. This is a program David Olds showed in multiple randomized control trials that he um, put on over the years, where a nurse, uh, 
a practitioner, a nurse, a public health nurse going into family homes could uh, help uh, to reduce um, poor birth outcomes for children, could reduce child maltreatment or use of the emergency room visits, and improve child well-being um, through language development and so on, through weekly home visits um, that would then get spread out over the course of the child's first two years of life. And in preparation for the idea that folks would want to know more about home visiting effectiveness, the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation commissioned for, put out for contract, um, an evidence review. And that's what you see in the bottom left-hand corner is an actually active website right now that reviews the evidence in home visiting. Um, all kinds of programs are reviewed there, and it describes in great detail the evidence in journal articles in the gray literature for home visiting programs. That evidence review was eventually used when the Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program was funded through the Affordable Care Act, and that's the act on the left-hand side, top left there. All of this is chronicled in Ron Haskins' book, Show Me the Evidence, which describes how evidence was used in the Obama administration for states to make decisions about which home visiting programs they were able to select from to use those McV, as we call them, dollars um, in their states. So again, this idea that evidence and an evidence pipeline would be used to make decisions. And the Parenting Matters report describes that kind of a process and makes a recommendation that policy be driven by this kind of a virtuous cycle, that an evidence-based pipeline be developed and supported in government to inform selection of the most strongly supported programming in our communities. And that's an exciting development. This is something that the science, that the science can support and be driven to meet the needs of communities and good decisions be made in communities. Where there is no evidence, we need to innovate and build new programs based on what families need, what practitioners know, but always building on the shoulders of what others have done um, out there in the community, out there in the scientific community as well. The other picture on the bottom um, right here is another systematic review of the evidence in teen parenting. That again was another emphasis um, and commissioned uh, uh, contracted review. Mathematica did that review as well. There are now systematic reviews in many different areas. The home visit mechanism for change, again, is through, through a practitioner, a home visitor coming into the home, working with parents to support parents as their, as their child's first teacher and again to help uh, stimulate child development, to increase the parent-child interaction, to, um, to support learning. Um, but that, that's again, the mechanism is through the parent-child interaction and Brenda will talk more about this. So again, this is um, a two-generation program. Early Head Start is a two-generation program. And what we're seeing now out in the world is this idea that you take a high-quality early childhood education program and pair it with the two-gen 2.0 program that Jeannie Brooks Gunn, um, Lindsay Chase Lansdale, uh, Teresa Summers are really working on at places like the Community Action Program in Tulsa with Stephen Dow, for example, and working very, very hard to put in programs that provide self-sufficiency supports, save for health, uh, for health supports, health education workers, uh, medical technology programs, and weave those together very, very intentionally for parents. It is no longer just a space in a building for working on your resume or an ESL program. It is very, very intentionally getting families a job. It is very, very intentionally supporting families through their diplomas and getting work, um, getting rewards along the way because they can be very long processes. So this is what we mean by a 2.0, a 2-gen 2.0 program, and that is, again, a move up and out, um, up and out of poverty supported by very high quality early childhood educational. Intentional work-oriented programs for adults with coordinated high quality ECE programs. 
I wanted to talk a bit about the Educare Impact Study, which just was published in Child Development. Again, built on the platform of Early Head Start, um, through the ounce of prevention, a, a large learning network supports that as well across the country. There are now more than 20 of these programs meant to be demos in communities. Again, you have them here through the generous support of the Early Childhood Fund. And I got to see the one in Indian Hill yesterday. It was just so exciting. I'm kind of collecting them. I go to them as many as I can around the country, and this is my first visit to Nebraska, so I was so thrilled to do that. This Birth to Five um, Demonstration Center, they are costly. They can cost from anywhere from 18,000 per child per year up, you know, we think they might be as much as 40,000 perhaps in California because of the union situation and so on. I would say I would want my child in such a center, you, all of us would want our child in such centers, but some, many people are paying $24,000 a year for infant toddler care in Washington, D.C., um, and, and so on, paying out of pocket for this. It's an equity issue, perhaps, and what we're seeing in this impact study is there are impacts after one year of Educare on language development, English language learning, on parent-child interactions, and so on. If this is what high-quality care costs, that's what high-quality care costs in this country. Linda Smith, as she was leaving the Department of Health and Human Services, put forward a very big ask for high-quality child care. Perhaps this is what it costs, and there's a longitudinal follow-up in the works. The study is very, very small, and I am saying I think that we need a replication study of this, a larger, high-quality replication study. The folks at UNC Chapel Hill are the third-party evaluator of this program, and it is a very high-quality study. So this is something really to be excited about, really to look at, and I urge you all to do so and something really to talk about. It didn't get as much splash in the press, it really hardly got any splash in the press, and I really wonder why. This is only the third recent study of infant toddler care that's out there, the Early Head Start Impact Study, the Program for Infant Toddler Caregiver Study, which had no impacts, and this one, which has very large impacts. I am excited about this study, and I think we need to talk some more about it. Again, as a way to get children into higher quality care, getting them into care, and having impacts as a way of potentially moving them um, and moving them into the system as a poverty alleviator. I mentioned before um, this Lancet uh, journal. I was, had the privilege to go to Dubai for the launch of the Lancet series and in the Middle East. The idea that UNICEF had was to launch it there with the hope that the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, would make a bigger investment in Southern Africa and in Asia for poverty alleviation, for investment in early childhood there. Um, and I came, I wrote a blog post about this, um, about my travels, about the intersection with what's going here in, on here in the US. It was startling how similar the issues are in Kinshasa, in, um, in Tanzania, um, and here in the US, in Camden, New Jersey. So these are just some of the observations um, that I had here. We're still not reaching the least reach, the very poorest, the deepest poverty here in our own country, similar issues around the world. The programmatic uh, so solutions, the policy solutions are very similar that were being put forward in the Lancet series. Things like supports for breastfeeding, supports for these, these uh, income supports, and so on. And evidence um, uh, needs to be informed, the pipeline needs to be informed by innovation and improvement. It is really startling. So improvement and innovation, um, again in the uh, the Parenting Matters Report, we talked a lot about the platforms that already exist. The family strengths are not the same. A one-size-fits-all solution is not going to work. They're unlikely. The depth of poverty issue is important. You need a different kind of solution for a $2 a day family, as Kathy Eden refers to it. Um, they're not, families are unlikely to be taking up services at the same rate uh, at that level versus families that are relatively better off. And learning collaboratives are showing some, uh, some promise around the world and here in the United States. So when we think about this question of the service platforms that are out there and available for us, whether it is early Head Start, whether it is um, home visiting, whether it's um, 
family resource centers in California and so on, they already exist. How can we build them out to serve more? We know, for example, we have childcare subsidies um, that are available, and we were talking about those yesterday. They are largely untapped by many families, as Ioma was saying. Why is that? Why aren't more families taking up childcare subsidies? These, again, these are, exist for families, but they're not being used. How can we put evidence-based programs into effect? How can workers, how can the, the, the workforce be um, trained and the supports provided to them to plug families into these existing care systems? Chapter seven of the Parenting Matters Report talks a lot about this framework that can be built out, and we really need to take a look at how that can be done from all the way from the bottom up locally from the, and from the supports from the federal government and top down. And some of this is being done and can be done further by design. So what we talk about um, in the report uh, and make a specific recommendation about is that the parents who are more organized, self-directed, get some adequacy of services within this loose network of services, but as Ed Ziegler has said before, we don't have a system of services. Really, we don't. People are trying more and more to build systems of care, systems of services, but families are largely on their own. So we need more coordinated services, an ongoing set of services. We need to be able to track families through the system and help know if, if a family is getting child welfare ser services over here, if a family is getting mental health services system over here, if they're the same families, those service providers should be talking to each other. How do we make that happen? Many of you have uh, thought about or are already doing shared data systems, perhaps. That has really been an effort. It's very difficult and hard with privacy issues but more and more communities are working on this and we need to work with each other to share those learnings. So recommendation number seven in our report talks a bit about this and I highlight it here, um, is that we really want to talk about innovation and improvement and that's in number three here, research on newly developed and existing interventions conducted through collaboratives. Um, the organization EDC is working on this in the McV program, in the Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. Mary Catherine Arbor, we call that out in the report through collaborative networks in the states. They're working particularly on things like breastfeeding. They're doing innovation and family engagement, coming up with new ways of attacking these problems in a collaborative in a rapid cycle way, using rapid cycle methods, go out, test it in your, in your community for a week, come back, talk about it as a group. Go out, do learning sessions about it monthly. These are exciting things, exciting times to be able to try this, using data as a support system. The president of Mathematica wrote a blog recently, um, it's called More Than an X, using evidence to improve programs and policies. And again, if we're only using data, only using evaluation to have a lights on, lights off effect on programs, that's a really a disservice. We are so far beyond that now. People are using data and information on a daily basis to improve programs. That's where we are and that's where we have to be. We talk about that in the, program, in the Parenting Matters report as well. Um, we want to resist doing that. We want to talk to policymakers. We want to talk to folks about that's not what we only want to write into legislation. We want this more learning idea. We want learning to be built into everything we do. Continuous quality improvement needs to be something more than just what we speak about it needs to be what we do. It can be threatening to program folks, right? It can be a concern. You come to my classroom and look and you tell me what I'm not doing right. Come and see what I'm doing and give me feedback. That's what we're talking about now. We want to be critics of each other in the positive way. Help me get better at what I do. And we're getting better and better at this. In the early learning lab that I work in, um, in Oakland, California, we're really putting our money where our mouth is. Through the generous support of the Packard Foundation, we are going out into communities and they're starting Smart and Strong initiative in school districts. Um, and we are tailoring solution making to the problems the districts are having in pre-K programs, in um, community-based childcare, in family, friend, and neighbor networks and saying, what is the problem you want to work on? Is it dual language learners? Is it social emotional behavior in classrooms? And is there an evidence-based solution that will help you? 
okay, great. If there is, we will help you install it with high quality. We will help work with your teachers to enact what's in that What Works Clearinghouse solution. And again, that's a really great resource for folks if you haven't had a chance to look at that from the Department of Education. Pull that off there, help install it, and so on, using implementation science techniques. But if there isn't, we'll help you innovate and come up with something that's tailored to your professional development hours. You may not have two weeks to learn something new, but we can help you think about backing into your professional development hours. So our approach here is co-creation, working with you to co-create. And we're not the only ones doing this. Jack Schoenkopf is doing this with his um, Frontiers of Innovation. Again, lots of folks are doing this across the country. But this is what we're talking about, a new way of doing business that hopefully will get us larger impacts, a way to do school readiness better, a way to do income supports better, working with families, doing executive functioning um, supports for adults, doing workforce differently in TANF um, offices. And again, lots of folks are thinking about this in a new way, and it's very, very exciting. Workers, families are excited about this because they're being included in the solution making. It's no longer an academic coming from on high and saying, do it this way. It's really, really different and inclusive. So it's co-creation, learning in rapid cycles, developing internal capacity. We're not just going to do this and run away. You're going to learn how to do it for yourself. And you build already on what is known. So again, this idea of a testing learning kind of a methodology. You're going to look at your own data and information, the local data and information, and ask yourself, what question do I want to work on? The co-design has lots of tools to support it. You're going to implement and engage in these quick learning cycles. And then you'll evaluate and scale what works. Do we have a new thing here? Is it good? Is it better than what we had before? And you're going to be increasing adult skills in doing that in agencies and locally so you can take on your next problem when the supports are gone. Again, that's the big problem with sustainability. This is just an example. Folks can't read it. But this is the idea of a driver diagram. It comes from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and Innovation. This is, comes from Don Berwick back in the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, for those of you who follow the federal government improvement approaches. These are very powerful. People like them very much. They clearly articulate where you're going. And, and again, these are tools people really like. So let's go back to just wrap up here quickly um, and think about poverty solutions and the things that we've been trying and, and things that are sort of on the cutting edge. There really have been a mix of policy and program tools to take on this question of childhood poverty. We've got the tax and the safety net programs that have been tried. We've had some, um, basically some stasis, right? We haven't been able to move this problem. Been at about 20% or so for, since about 1997. But we have, when we think about the safety net, we have moved children and families when we take that all together. The safety net as it is now is somewhat threatened. We have to think about what that really means. Um, and it's less clear in other program areas, the, the parenting area. And if we want to think about these two Gen 2.0 programs and really thinking about working on uh, families working and supports for that, that's a new area, thinking about that. We really don't know all that much about children and families at very deep levels of poverty, which programs work for them and don't. We don't talk about that very much. It's a real area for focus. We're looking to this new National Academies uh, group to see can, what are the programs and policies that could get families out of poverty, half of families out of poverty in 10 years. That's very exciting. And let's think about being bolder about getting families out of poverty. What could we really put towards this issue as a collective and get people excited about this once again to take this on. How do we engage with the users of the services, with families themselves? What do they want to need? What can they bear as far as what, what could be offered to them? And also with, a family, with the uh, workers and program uh, leaders uh, that, that do this, and policymakers. What would get them excited? What would get them bought in to making these changes? I wanted to tell you a final wrap-up story about the beginning of my career at Mathematica. I started at Mathematica 21 years ago. I'm a developmental and cognitive psychologist. Um, I had not worked in public policy before. I studied infant memory development before coming to Mathematica. Um, so this was not my thing. I was taught how to do focus groups by one of my colleagues. I was in Fairfax, Virginia at an early Head Start program. And at the end of a focus group, I asked this question. I asked, what would you like the federal government to know about 
your experiences in early Head Start. And it was a woman who was an immigrant um, from Mexico, and she was speaking Spanish, and it was being her response was being translated for me. And she said to me, she said, what if we did everything the Early Head Start program asked us to do? We brought our child to the center um, all the time. We went to the parenting education activities. Um, and we, you know, we tried to get jobs and we worked very hard, but we were still poor. I didn't know what to say and I actually started to cry. I still don't know exactly what the answer is to that question. And I think it's time for us all to think very hard about the answer to this question. We still are paying an, a poverty wage to our childcare providers, most of us. You know, I pers you know if we we're doing that ourselves as, as folks who make an income, we may pay the folks who mow our lawns more than we pay our childcare providers, right? In childcare centers, we are paying a poverty wage for most of our um, childcare workers. We really need to think about that in this country and need to think about, again, how to answer her question. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah? Oh, mic microphone's working. Okay. Kim, that was fantastic. And you actually left off in a really perfect place. Uh, <laughs> except the only one, the only thing I want to make sure to change is what would you like the federal government to know? What would you like local and state policymakers to know? Uh, for those of you, uh, I know you saw on the program, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself uh, and explain a little bit how this, I hope my perspective is a little different, and it should be. I'm not a researcher. Uh, I am I'm not uh, a, a deep into uh, doing focus groups. My job as a policymaker requires making decisions, uh, informing myself as much as possible, and I want to share a little bit about uh, my trajectory in that and how it is deeply connected to poverty, specifically in Omaha and in this state, uh, and what I've learned so far in the legislature and why it's important for policymakers to be informed people. Uh, so the first thing is, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Senator Tony Vargas. I am uh, born and raised in New York. Uh, I'm a very proud uh, uh, son of Peruvian immigrants. I always start my introductions with that because uh, oftentimes we don't understand or we don't always get to understand the perspectives of others. Uh, and I venture to say in this room, um, when we're here, it's because we're trying to understand how poverty impacts families that are not often like us. Uh, and that is a part of me that I try not to lose sight of um, because my parents, being immigrants to this country when they were 19, uh, they had this notion of the American dream, it's why they came here. Um, but like you and I know, having the American dream, there are many different barriers when you do not have an education, when you do not have uh, the language capacity, uh, when you don't have connections, uh, and as a result, these, these combined uh, barriers for my parents at a very early age and then not being able to get work uh, is, was one of the reasons why my family was in poverty. Uh, and so growing up as somebody in poverty, I try not to lose sight of that because it's exactly the reason I believe why we're here. Um, there are realities that I faced uh, in my family, being the youngest of three. Uh, the first is my parents not having the language capacity, uh, and I try to keep, keep grounded in this, uh, it was a barrier in just access, just simple access to everything. Uh, access to be able to jobs, access to quality government services, access to be able to, de to advocate on, on behalf of themselves and their friends and family. Uh, and it's something that my parents reminded me of as we were growing up. Uh, I was fortunate that my parents were able to get jobs, uh, were able to work uh, and, and mo work multiple jobs, but as a result, this meant that they were uh, not around as much. This also meant that uh, I was not spending a lot of time with my, my parents. This also meant that the time that I spent with my parents wasn't meant 
them communicating with me as much. Uh, I was spent a lot of time with a caregiver that mostly spoke Spanish. And at that time, I was trying to manage both languages. Uh, growing up with my brothers, uh, we struggled mightily. Uh, my, both my brothers uh, have special education needs at ADHD, ADD. And as we were growing up, we realized something very, very quickly that there's this interconnectedness between both where we are growing up and poverty. And so my parents took it upon themselves to uh, actually change the atmosphere, the environment that we were in. Um, after about the age of eight, eight, they decided that they wanted to move out to uh, a, a more uh, affluent suburb to make sure that the education that they attained was a different education than the ones we were receiving in Queens. Uh, I bring this up because I do not believe that every single one of the families or the individuals we work with have the same opportunity, which is why it's incumbent upon us to figure out what can we do within the realm of the policies and the environment that they're currently in to make sure that they can thrive. Uh, I was fortunate enough that my parents sacrificed a lot I was able to go to college. Uh, I went to the University of Rochester in upstate New York. I studied biology and psychology. Uh, I was the first in my generation to go to college uh, and then got my master's in education while simultaneously uh, deciding to become a teacher uh, in Brooklyn, New York City. This was a very, very important part of my life. It's what informed uh, my policy making is uh, even though I'd grown up in poverty, it's not enough that we understand where we come from, but it, we have to understand where other families in similar circumstances, how they're more nuanced and different to be able to create some larger, broader policy initiatives that are going to help parents. Uh, I taught in Sunset Park in Brooklyn, uh, which is a very, very diverse, uh, high poverty area, mostly Latino, and it's something that uh, I, I remind myself because the students in my classroom, uh, the majority, 85%, were in free reduced lunch program. The um, majority of my parents uh, had uh, many different look, looks of, in terms of what the parenting home looked like. We had single families. We had families that were had by the grandparents and some that had different caregivers. Um, and so as a teacher, as a young teacher, it was incumbent upon me to ensure that we are not only uh, in charge of the educational attainment of the students in my classroom, but the social emotional learning of the kids in my classroom, the, uh, the goal setting, the, the, the emotional side of developing competencies and values, and then this really interesting part of, I was also spending a significant amount of time with parents educating them on the same values that I was instilling in their children. Um, which required home visits, which required a significant amount of parent-teacher meetings, which required more outreach than I would have normally uh, expected when I first became a teacher. Um, but this does remind me that uh, we cannot have a one-size-fits-all in the way that we are adopting policies, in the way that we are adopting programs. Uh, I spent more time calling and more time with uh, the individuals in my parents that were having the hardest time reaching um, because I knew that it was incumbent upon me to spend more time with them to be able to educate them on transparency, what's happening with the classroom, the systems in place so that we're, we're creating a set of behavioral procedures in the classroom and the social emotional learning uh, components that we're putting in place to make sure that the students are learning as much as they possibly can and can become self-sufficient once they, they get beyond elementary, middle school, and to, and to high school. Uh, my time in the classroom was uh, one of the most influential parts of my policy experience, uh, and it wasn't the end. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be appointed to a higher education committee in New York, uh, where I worked on higher education and teacher preparation and support. Uh, in New York, I also is where I met my wife, uh, who is from Nebraska. Her family is all born and raised here, which is the reason why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> And so about five years ago, we moved uh, from New York City to, uh, to Omaha. And I will tell you, it was a very intentional, intentional reason why we moved to Omaha. Um, and it's interesting. I know we're talking with some of our future speakers earlier today when we, I asked them where they were from, and they said they were from D.C. And uh, you know, I immediately made this emotional connection because from New York to D.C. to Omaha, one of the things that I really thought sought out moving here 
was that um, there would be a purpose and a place for a policymaker, especially with my perspective um, in this city. And this city it has very much similarities with many other areas, urban centers, um, that we have large amounts of poverty, we have a large immigrant population, we have a significant influx of refugees, uh, and as a result, it's, it's something that is uh, part of the fabric of urban centers and is part of the fabric of Omaha. So it was intentional that I came here because I wanted to make sure that there was something that I can do that's going to have an impact. Uh, otherwise, my mother would probably uh, question why I'm moving halfway across the country. Uh, moving here, one of the first experiences that I had uh, and is Shortly after moving here, I was lucky enough to be selected to be on, become on the Omaha Public School Board. Now, uh, the local context here is, on the Omaha Public School Board, it's a nine-member board, and one of the most important pieces that I learned from being on this board is that uh, the city that we are in has deeply rooted, in many of the barriers that our, our children are facing is rooted in, in poverty. Um, more, more specifically, it's rooted in uh, very deep pockets of poverty across our city, and that is where we have the most significant amount of resources, and where we also have the hardest time reaching our parents and families. I represented the district, uh, District 9, on the Omaha Public School Board, which represented about 75% of the students who were in free and reduced lunch program. That 75% plus were students of color, uh, Latino, uh, African American, or refugees. This is very, very important because it's very different than most of the other sub-districts with across Omaha, which means I was really interested in how we're further differentiating support mechanisms to our city and to our district. Uh, and as a policymaker, I was more interested in how are we creating a strategic plan to guide all of the amazing work that we should be doing and we are currently doing. Uh, and so when we briefly came in the first few years, one of our largest tasks was creating a strategic plan. Uh, I bring this up because as policymakers and, and, and something we, we just heard, uh, there's a level of implementation and follow through and a coherence of policy structures that is extremely important for making sure that we are eradicating poverty while simultaneously making sure we're educating the next generation. Um, and what we did is employ this strategic plan process, which looked at all the different data metrics that we could collect on what are we really seeing, what are the underlying causes and effects of what we're seeing in Omaha, and trying not to just touch on the surface level impacts of poverty, but the more uh, un underlying factors that are impacting poverty. The strategic plan process guided a significant amount of what we did at OPS, uh, and it still does, and I think that's the beauty uh, one thing that I've learned and I hope more policymakers take into account is sometimes we have our own personal agendas. It's more important that we come together as local policymakers, local community stakeholders, um, and elected officials, and parents, students, to make sure that we're creating a, a cogent pathway to utilize all the resources we have available. Because as a policymaker, I am not going to be here forever. Uh, there is a changing face of, of elected officials. And in fact, in, in, even on the OPS school board, we have a, many changing faces on the OPS school board, which is why it's so important that we have our strategic plan that has been guiding the work to make sure that we are setting clear metrics on how we are reaching parents, uh, how, we, how they're feeling about the support services we're creating, our emphasis on early childhood development and programs, our, S, our emphasis on social emotional learning programs, and how we are further evaluating the programs to make sure that we are not saying there's a one size fits all and everything is working correctly, but more importantly, we are gonna continuously measure the effectiveness of programs to ensure we're getting the most important facet uh, that is being delivered to our students and our, and our, and our parents, which is high quality programming. Uh, being on the school board taught me a lot about being a policymaker. It's one of the reasons why I decided to run for higher office. I realized specifically in my district that although we had uh, implemented a significant amount of change with a strategic plan, that we were not done yet. Uh, many of the, th the pieces that we needed to focus on existed outside of the classroom. 
Uh, and I'll be the first to say, uh, and I, I say this to, to many of my friends and colleagues, that the I believe one of the pathways out of poverty is education. Uh, but I believe the second pathway out of poverty is ensuring that parents um, are finding a pathway to having careers, jobs, and are able to then be effective parents. And that's what we're seeing from this report for their children. And so when I looked at my district and I looked at the greater needs, uh, there was a much more needed emphasis on addressing things outside of the classroom and outside of education. I was fortunate enough to be able to be on the uh, to transition from the school board to the Nebraska legislature and was elected to District 7. It's the same overlap district for the most part with my school board district. Um, and so as you can imagine, if my parents, sorry, if my students in my district are high in free and reduced lunch, high people of color population, higher poverty population, the makeup of the parents in my district was very, very similar. And so there were deeper problems that as a policymaker that we started to acknowledge and notice. And as part of one of the reasons why in the legislature, me and many other colleagues have focused and continued on with this effort of how do we as policymakers ensure that we are creating sustainable long-term policy decisions that are going to make sure that parents are set up for success and that we are eradicating poverty in our highest poverty areas. In my area, there are many different uh, facets that we needed to focus on. The first is health care. We talked about this need for ensuring that parents have access to quality, uh, quality health care and are, that it's accessible. Unfortunately, when we looked at the district, uh, there was a significant amount of parents that were not covered, uh, were not, uh, there's two different things, that they were not currently uh, covered on, and they were in the Medicaid gap that existed in the state of Nebraska. I'm seeing some head nods. And then the second piece is there was a lack of actually taking advantage of existing programs. We saw not as many uh, individuals, it wasn't that they were eligible, weren't taking advantage of some of the programs like CHIP. And so as a result, I realized that there was a longer term um, need for policymakers to figure out how do we make sure that we're improving access to these programs, and then how do we make sure that we're covering more people that fall within uh, a qualified gap or, or need. Um, I also saw in my district that uh, there is a large population of individuals that were not in, in careers, that were unemployed. Uh, and it seems very common sense that we need to focus on employment, but one of the biggest barriers was not whether or not we had jobs. One of the biggest barriers wasn't simply career readiness. One of the biggest barriers was whether or not we were catching students right out of high school and making sure that they are getting a quality education and then can enter the workforce, not whether or not just their parents were career ready. And so there was a multiple, multiple factors that we needed to, to take into account to ensure that parents are getting the skills necessary, and that was another focus that we wanted to focus on in the legislature. Um, one of the other things that we realized and informed a lot is there are many additional factors that are impacting poverty in my district. Uh, the financial burdens of, of not being able to foot, put food on the table. And we're seeing individuals, many individuals that are on SNAP. Uh, we're seeing predatory lending playing a significant role in higher poverty areas across the state. Uh, and we are continuing to see a lack of educational attainment in our highest areas. That even though in my South Omaha area we have improved the school district um, and we're seeing higher graduation rates, the actual educational attainment or competencies that we're seeing students demonstrate on state tests was not matching those from some of our more affluent areas in Omaha. Uh, and so I was realizing there's more that needs to be done. Um, joining the Nebraska legislature, one of the key pieces of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, study information that I think is important to reference was the Intergenerational Poverty Task Force. This actually uh, was conducted a few years ago that helped guide a significant amount and is still guiding legislation that is being created to tackle the deep pockets of poverty that we're seeing across the state of Nebraska. Uh, and I, I think it's important to note that out of this poverty task force, many of the issues that I had seen in my own district, uh, there were policy uh, decisions and policy recommendations that were being uh, put on the table to make sure that we are doing everything we can to address the same things that could impact my district. 
Um, but what I realized very quickly in this legislature and why I think it's important for um, not just policymakers but all stakeholders to understand is uh, as, as people that are developing policy, research, teachers, practitioners, uh, we need to do more to be able to elevate uh, the story and the narrative coming out of data because even though there was legislation this year focused on expanding and, uh, the, the number of individuals that can uh, fall within uh, to address the, med the, the Medicaid gap, to uh, address more people being able to be eligible for SNAP benefits, to make sure that we're creating uh, a more competitive rates for uh, Medicaid providers, to make sure there's access to quality health care. Um, all of these pieces of legislation did not move out into the Nebraska legislature this year. And it's not because there wasn't data to support whether or not it was the right move. It's not because there isn't a perceived or current need. There was a very, very clear need in our state. And it's not because there isn't, uh, own, there isn't clear will of the people. It's because we lack the political will to be able to create uh, a, a, a clear narrative as to how this is not only gonna impact those in poverty, but how it's gonna impact the social and economic well-being of the city and our state. Uh, and so that's something that I'm very, very focused on, uh, on completing in the next three years in the legislature. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the pieces of legislation that I introduced and was passed uh, that deals with this area in particular. Um, the first is um, this emphasis on and this will be one of the last things I leave on, uh, LB-427. Um, one thing that we learned from LB-427, which is a bill that specifically is focused on um, two things. The first is, uh, and we heard this a little bit in, in, in the presentation previously, uh, that there are students across the state of Nebraska that are becoming pregnant and are becoming teenage mothers. And one of the barriers to their completing their education, which is further contributing to them being in long-term poverty, is actually whether or not they have support mechanisms to be able to stay in school. And so one part of LB 427 was to make sure that we have breastfeeding accommodations for student mothers in schools. The second part of LB 427 was that school districts, school boards, will develop a set of policies to ensure that parents, student parents, um, have a set of support mechanisms in place to ensure that they can uh, finish school. And these four specific support mechanisms, I think, are very much in line with the many of the things we talk about. The first is that we are making sure that there is a clear pathway to having that student finish their education so that they can make sure they finish their coursework and make sure that they can finish uh, and have some accommodations with absence policies so that they're not further in potentially a juvenile justice uh, pathway. Um, the second piece is making sure they have an accommodation for breastfeeding. Uh, and, and the final piece is actually making sure they have information to quality early child care uh, that is available in an area. And so these two bills, uh, which were very much in line with many of the things that we're talking about and in line with making sure we're addressing issues of poverty in high areas, um, was a very, very difficult bill to pass because there were uh, senators across the state. Um, while there was significant data, there were barriers to being able to present the, the right narrative and for more stakeholders to be able to talk about the stories that we're actually hearing from parents and families. Uh, and something that uh, reminded me that as policymakers, we need people in this room, stakeholders, to be able to elevate more of those stories so that we can follow through on the more effective and sustainable policies that we need in Nebraska. Um, the last thing that I'll leave you with are just a couple of things that I learned from the, the, this pathway to passing this bill and making sure we're doing everything to eradicate poverty in Nebraska. Is just a couple of things I learned. The first is, uh, in order to make sure that we are doing everything we can uh, to ensure that parents have all the tools they need and that we're eradicating poverty, I do believe that we need to do more to study uh, policies that are, are more coherent. 
Uh, and what that means to me is we're not just looking at uh, how these individual policies are impacting parents, let's say like how we're going to potentially expand SNAP, ex uh, expand on SNAP in, in, in Nebraska, or how we're going to make sure we're expanding on Medicaid, but what's the confluence of how we can sustain those resources for parents and families across the state of Nebraska. The second thing I really learned is we need to make sure that we're following through on the implementation of programs and services. I think for too often, policymakers are looking for the new thing to do. What is the new program or service that data is telling us that is more improved? Rather than over the five to 10 years, we need to do a 2.0, a follow through on the implementation of existing programs and learn how to just make them better. As policymakers, I think we are often trying to find the silver bullet, and I'm asking practitioners and people in this room to try to make sure we are not doing that because I think it moves us away from following through on the things that we can do. Um, and with that, uh, because of my time, I just want to thank everybody and, and, and happy to answer questions afterwards, or you can come up after me, and I'm more happy to talk to you more about uh, the legislature and more issues that I've faced. Thank you.